the class is in memory of Jared Olshan, and today we will learn the study in the book of Psalms, chapter 56. It's on page 155. We will read a few lines, two lines I would say, and then we'll talk about it. For the leader on Yonah Selim Rebokim? Rehokim? Yeah, I keep going. Michtam of David. Michtam means from the word tam. Tamim means tam means complete. David was a complete person. He was complete for a few reasons. <coughs> but one of the reasons, Medrash says here, that he was born circumcised. He was complete. He didn't have to be fixed. He was complete. When? When the Philistine sees him in God. God. The Philistine system in God. What happened there in God? What happened with the Philistines? Ay, ay, ay. You know, David used to run away from Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. David was the son-in-law, but he hated him because he was afraid he will take it. He will... He's more popular. And one time when he was running away, he ran away to... He went to the Palestine city with the name Gat. The king was there, Achish. Achish was the name of the king of God. He arrives there, and who is the meeting there? The, the bodyguards of the king were Goliath's brothers. <laughs> he said, oh, we know this guy! <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to kill him. <laughs> Achish said, the king said, no, no, no. Isn't this Goliath all brought upon himself? Mm -hmm. Goliath made a deal. Oh, he was a righteous man. He says, Goliath says, whoever, whoever kills the other, that's, he says, if, I, if, if, the, if the Palestine kills the Jews, the, all the Jews will become servants, and the, that was a fair war. It was a war, in the, that was, uh, it was the, the rules of the war. What do you want from him now? You cannot come later and kill him. And he didn't want to, he didn't allow to kill him. That they told them, really, if this is the case, Goliath said, if the other guy wins the war, we will all be his servant, and he will be the king. In this case, Mr. Rachish, give up your seat, and appoint David the king. That was the deal. You go by the deal, let's go all the way. Achish then, uh, he was a righteous man, he didn't want to kill David, but he's not about to give up his seat. <laughs> You know, you can be righteous, but there is a limit how righteous you're going to be. <laughs> then he wanted to kill David. That David was in very big dangers. He prayed to God that God should give him a gift that at once upon a time he was doubting the need of this gift. Once King David, according to the message, said God to God, God, why have you created Meshugoyim on earth? Why crazy people? What do you mean it's crazy people? What good is this doing? People make fun of them. They run around on the street. They're crazy. He needs it. Then he told them, God told them, so to speak, oh, David, uh, one day you'll realize how much you need it. Then David prayed to God, should give him the gift of, go of being Meshuggah. Going crazy. And, ki and King Ochish, Ochish, the king of God, had a Meshuggah and a wife, crazy wife and a crazy daughter. And they used to say inside, inside the palace and make noise and scream and yell and run around. It was terrible. Suddenly, he has David from outside, screaming and yelling. And he was writing on the doors, king, uh, the, the king of God is owing me this and this amount of money, and his wife is owing me th At one point, oh, he screamed on his servant, are you crazy? Dude, I'm, I'm short of Meshugayim, Hassan Meshugayim Anochi. I don't have enough Meshugayim in my, in my courtyard. You bought me another one. Send them away. Let them throw him out. That's how King David was saved from, from, the, from, from being killed by, by Ochishman, the king of God. That's how close to that he was. And because he doubted God, why we need craziness, he himself needed craziness to save his life. And whenever a person says, oh, God, I, don't, I think I'm smart. I, you don't need this. It can be better without it. God says, okay, we'll meet you there. Then we'll see. Don't think you're smarter. It says a connection to the parasha of, of the we read yesterday. 
in Shabbos, we read about uh, Moses when he came down to, he came up to Mount Sinai to receive the first tablet. God taught him 13 attributes of mercy. That if the, if the Jews will sin, that's what should he pray for, for forgiveness. That Moses said, forgiveness? Whoever sins should be punished. God told him, <laughs> Reb Moshe, you'll need it. <laughs> came to the golden calf. Moses started to say, Hashem, Hashem, kel rachum v'chanu no yo yo ya. God told him, hey, Reb Moshe, didn't you say anybody who sins should be? Moses said, but God, you God, you merciful God, said that the people can be forgiven. Then whenever somebody says, oh, who needs it? You won't like that. Be careful. That's the story, when, that's the prayer that King David said when he was by the Philistines in, in God. All the, they all that for, they, they kept him. Okay. Have mercy on me. O oh God, for men devour me. All day long my adversary oppresses me. My enemies aim to devour me all day. Many are my adversaries, exalted one. When I am afraid, I will trust you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. When can mortals do, what can mortals do to me? That's the level of faith that, more that David had in God. He says, I cannot have faith in any human being. They're all a bunch of moms. They all want to hurt me. They all want to do everything to me. The only one I can, I can have faith is in you, God. All day long they cause me grief in my affairs. All their intentions are to harm me. They assemble, they lie in ambush, observing my every move, hoping to take my life. They hope to profit because of their evil. In your anger, subdue these people, O God. You who keeps count of my wanderings, put my tears in your flask into your record. God put the tears in his record. There is no tears who go wasted. A person prays, and he feels, oh, it didn't help this person. It didn't help this person. But the prayers are not going for, uh, uh, for not. God, as the language of the Talmud is, the God puts all the, all the tears in a special picture, so to speak, in a special uh, place to treasure, and he closes it, and he keeps it, so to speak, from the day that the person will need it. The prayers don't go in waste. It's not for not, for nothing. It, even it didn't help this place, helped in other places. Then my enemies will retreat when I call on you. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. What can man do to me? Mm -hmm. I must pay my vows to you, God. I will render thank offerings to you. Okay, we'll stop right here. I must pay my vows to you. I will render thanks offerings to you. The Talmud says something very amazing. Thanks offerings. Oh, there is many kinds of sacrifices, right? There is sin offerings. There is a, a different atonement offering for 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 a, for a, there is a peace offering and so on, and there is thanksgiving offering. The Talmud says the Moshiach will come. The only offering will be left is thanksgiving offering. Then the Talmud goes on and says even more. When Moshiach will come, there will be no prayers. The only prayers will be, will be a thanksgiving prayer. On a simple level, what does this mean? Why will not be more prayers? Are we yeah, not going to pray? change, there won't be any more soon. Okay, that's why we don't need sin offerings. What is prayers? What's the purpose of prayers? To ask for my need. Mm -hmm. And everybody's needs will be fulfilled. We will not need any more, pray any more prayers. You'll have everything. Like in America, you have everything. <laughs> what do you need? So huh? So you still just have to offer things. Just, <laughs> huh? There, there is kind of a dispute on that, isn't there, between Maimonides and Nachmanides? About what, yeah. Nachmanides says that human nature will change and, and that a lot of it will change in the Messianic age because of that. Mm -hmm. And Maimonides says, no, that human beings will still be the same, and so you still have all the same rules, all the same offerings, all the same everything. Yeah, it, this is true. 
this is true, but uh, in this rules, usually in this issue, we go more more with Nachmanides than with Maimonides. Mm -hmm. Number two, what means it will not change? He says will not be war in the world. That's Maimonides says. Mm -hmm. And and goods will be like dirt. Ma'adani mitzuim kerofon. All the good stuff will be as much as dirt. No problem. You have everything. He just said that enemies, the idea that a, a wolf will live together with a sheep, whatever the language there in the, in the Bible, this is just an a allegorical description. But he says there will be no wars and no jealousy and no competition. That's my money, he says. Mm -hmm. So human nature does change in a sense. Obviously, human <laughs> nature. That even my monodies cannot run away from it, that human nature will... What could be more? No jealousy and no competition. Would human nature change or not? Tell me. What could be more a change of human nature than that? Then if there is no jealousy and everything is available, then you don't need to pray, you have everything. Right? Then you don't need to pray. The only thing you need to say is thank you. But prayer has two levels. Prayers is not just to ask for our needs. What's prayers? We know that we have we pray during the week. We pray on Shabbat. I don't want you to discourage you come Shabbos to show, but the prayer on Shabbat, on Shabbos, you're not allowed to ask for your personal need. Why? Because Shabbos, you have to feel like a messianic age. You have everything. Everything is done. You're not missing anything. You're sitting by Shabbos by the table, you have to feel like the king. I have everything. Now, everything I have. I'm not missing anything. I have no problems, no pain, no angst, no gunished. I'm perfect. That's what a person has to feel on Shabbat. Then what's the prayers on Shabbat? First of all, let's say for my needs. You know, how many times can I need God for my needs? And how long it takes, God, I need a villa in a Volvo. And I'm, <laughs> now I'm going to do it. Obviously, prayers is much more than just asking for my need. Prayers, in Hebrew, tefillah comes in the word to feel, to connect, to attach. Prayers is a relationship with God. Prayers is bending God's ear. I came to have a conversation with them. You spend quality time with your wife, with your spouse. You spend quality time with your children. You spend quality time with God. Prayers is about establishing a relationship with God. You know, usually you have to pay to a shrink to listen to you. God is doing it for free. <laughs> and he loves you even more. He's not looking for the check. He's doing it unconditionally. The prayers is much more than just it's, a, it, it's about a connection, becoming closer to God. That if prayers is about becoming closer to God, why we don't have to do it and and the Moshiach will come? Don't we need to have to get closer to God? The knowledge of God will be so obvious and so widespread that oh. the connection is already there, right? Oh, the connection is there. The same question is about a very interesting statement that Maimonides brings from the from the Medrash. From Maimonides, when he writes the laws of Purim, he just came from Purim. He writes, "Oh, the Moshiach will come. All the holidays will be nullified beside Purim." You heard about this statement? Yeah, yeah. What does this mean? Or Shoshone will go to the beach. What does this mean? <laughs> Not a bad idea, by the way. <laughs> Pesach, who is correct to clean and to cook? And to, well, 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 and isn't this more than that? The question is deeper and bigger and wider. The question is, don't we believe that the, you, know, you just came with the principles of, the, of Maimonides? What is the famous principle of Maimonides? The 13 principles? One of them. About the Torah. The Torah will never change. The Torah will never change, right? The, the, the Torah will never change. How could my manadis, the same my manadis, say that the Moshiach will come? We will not, we will not have any holidays. All the all the holidays betailing, be nullified. Betail, literally, it means be gone. Beside Purim. And what's exciting about Purim? Because it says, because it's written, the Megillah Zichom Lo Yosem Mizarom. The memory of Purim will never be. He eradicated from the children, erased from their, from their, from their descendants. A language that's not written about any other day. So forget about that. 
It's not, not only it's in the Bible. Pesach, Shavuos, and Sokis is in the Bible. Right? What do you mean it's going to be changed? Didn't the same Maimonides say that the Torah will never be changed? The same thing is about sacrifices. How is this, this Talmudic uh, statement says, uh, uh, says that the, all the sacrifices will be, changed, will be, null, will be nullified. It says uh, in the future error, prayers will be, will be nullified. The Talmud, and, and, and the same thing about, about the sacrifice. What do you mean? Are the Torah is going to change? Don't we know a fundamental concept that the Torah will never be changed? If you knew this, the principle for Maimonides that the Torah will never be changed, and you knew the statement that Maimonides said that, the, that, the, that, that all the holidays will be nullified beside Purim, how you were able to sleep? Mm -hmm. This contradiction. Some people say that Maimonides has one set of rules for, for you know, the more academic people out there, and another set of rules for people who are kind of more common people. But he cannot, he cannot contradict himself. The same person cannot contradict himself. Because if he contradicts himself, then we cannot take anything of him. It's the, guy to it's the same person. You can say he writes on a more practical level to one type of people, on a more scientific or academic level, to not, but he cannot contradict himself. Mm -hmm. The answer is, ah? Uh, perplexed. Guided. I know, yeah. Not he's perplexed. Was he it in was there? the, the guide for the perplexed. Was it in there? <laughs> now, this contradiction is from the 13 principles. It's written, we wrote the 13 principles of it. Uh, and it's commentary to the Mishnah. Commentary to the Mishnah. Very good. Here you go. Hmm. And the, this law that the old holidays will be, will be nullified, it's written in his book, is in, in a monumental book, Yada Hazoko, Mishnah Torah, it's called. The main book that he wrote in Hebrew. You know, my mother this wrote all his books in Arabic. Only one book he wrote in Hebrew, the Code of Law that he wrote. It's called the Mishneh Torah. The, it's a review of the whole Bible, of the, basically the, the Code of Jewish Law that he wrote. He wrote, it was a codifier. That's what he wrote in Hebrew. The rest of his books are, are in Arabic. In any case, the, the Rebbe explains this thing. What does this mean? All the holidays will be cancelled, will be nullified. He says, what's a holiday? What holiday brings us? Joy. Beautiful! Joy! Finally, nailed it. Good. <laughs> we call it Moadim Le Simcha. Holidays of Joys. It's a mitzvah to rejoice on holidays. Soon Pesach is coming. Every husband has to buy to his wife jewelry to make her happy. Because on the holiday, it will be happy. <laughs> it's on record. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, for children, you have to bring, bring candies. For men, you have to eat meat and wine. That's what brings joy. That means holiday's purpose is to bring joy to the Jewish people. That's one of the explanations why, you know, we have the blessing of the Kohens only on the holidays. Because the Kohen, when he has to bless the congregation, he has to be in a good mood. He has to be besimcha. When we know for sure he must be besimcha, on Yontef. During the rest of the year, it's in exile. Who is simcha? Who is... In any case, that holiday is supposed to bring joy. The Moshiach will come, will be such a level of joy, that people tell you, Pesach is coming, Pesach is coming. We are, we are celebrating every day, 10 times what Pesach is. The joy is 10 times bigger. Tell me Pesach, we have much more than that. It's like somebody who won a million dollars, then you tell them, you know, you won a lot of lottery for fifteen dollars. <laughs> I said, "Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Tell me fifteen dollars. I'm busy with a million dollars now. Before, fifteen dollars was for him. Whoa, was amazing. Now, fifteen dollars. Nothing changed. It's the same human being with the same. The, the fifteen dollars didn't change. The fifteen dollars had the same value. The only difference is now he's, he's a millionaire." You light you, a candle in a room, it's, very, it's a lot of light. But you, then you turn on the light, the candle is meaningless. Then you bring another candle, said, oh, oh, we have a candle. Who needs a candle with this huge light? There will be such a joy that the, the joy that the holidays bring with them will be like a candle in front of a projector. You, yeah, nobody will deny the holiday. It's not to go to the beach. But Pesach will not bring any excitement. Pesach. We have much more than Pesach. We have much more than Shavuos. We have much more than Sukkot. Every day is much more enjoyable than Pesach. So you're recognizing the holidays. We are recognizing the holidays, but the holidays will not be 
exciting because the level of excitement that the Jewish people will be will be much higher than that. What does this mean in our... Then why Purim? Well, with world peace, we won't have to worry about being wiped out anymore. What's Purim? Why Purim is exciting? It will still be around. What's different about Purim from the rest of the, of the other days? Purim? How we rejoice Purim different than the rest of the other days? You don't do it, that's why you don't know. And Purim, you have to be drunk, right? <laughs> it's a law. Adeloyada. It means to say, and Purim is a joy that surpasses all the other holidays. It's on a different level. The rest of the holiday, you have to be happy. You drink a little wine, you eat a little meat. <laughs> We're all happy. <laughs> and Purim, you forget who you are. You have to lose yourself. This level of joy will still be something different. Than, even when Mashiach will come, we are not going to be shikher every day, you understand? Then Purim will still make it, uh, make it end. We'll still make it different. There'll be such a joy that even when, in time of Mashiach, when we will all be joy, joyful every day of the year, we'll still make it different. That's what will be important. That's why Purim will, will, will be recognized. It doesn't mean that all the holidays will not, will not exist, but they will not make it different, not make it dent. Purim will make it dent. When a, when, a, when a happy guy who just did a good few lachines walks into the room, even when Moshiach comes, they'll say, oh, this is a happy guy. Happier than with the most happy people. You understand? The same thing is about here when you talk about prayers. Prayers is about a connection to God. About our needs. We will not have any needs. All our needs will be met. Our uh, connection to God we will enjoy the Moshiach who comes such a connection to God that prayers are nothing compared to it. The willingness of God will be so big and so strong that prayers, I, I, I'm on a higher level before I pray. What prayers will still be needed? Only thanksgiving prayers. What needs to thanks? First of all, you have to thanks no matter what. No matter how much you have, you have to thank every time for God. Then a simple level. But on a deeper level, thanking God is an admission to something that is a, it's beyond your logic. I think, I, I admit, the word odaa as in itself the word admitting, admitting that there is something bigger than me. It's not only what I understand, what I appreciate. There is, happens to me miracles that I don't even understand from where they're coming. Bigger than I deserve. I make, when I can make myself a receptacle for God, when I, when I lose myself, I lose my identity. It's not about me, it's about God. Reaching a higher level, when you lose you, it's not I want and I need and I... It's, it's and appreciate, realizing that I don't understand what God is all about. That's what thinks, thinking God is all about. Do you, do you ever feel yourself um, like just like overwhelmed with, with, with this whole... I mean, just, it just, it's just... You really can't... It's just there... Sure. How I mean, do you deal with it? How you deal with it? I'll tell you, it's a problem. It's not a therapy group. But... <laughs> <laughs> but he yells but, out, Miriam? <laughs> I mean, the first cry from the first baby brings me back to reality very fast. <laughs> but what I mean to say is, it's not about... It's when you start to think about God, you, you learn, you, you realize it's bigger than you. That's what it's all about. Now, what means to deal with that? To deal with that is by commitment. You know, why we have in, in life, you have ave vera, love and fear. Why is love not enough? One spirit person should ask me, why not enough to love God? Why not to, why we need to fear God? And I told them, you love your wife. You still fear her, right? Why you need to fear your wife if you love her? Because fear of God grounds you. Out of love of God, you can do bad things. Only love, out of love of God. I love him so much, but I don't have time to dive. And I will now dance for an hour out of love to God. God said, you have to dare now, not to dance. <laughs> I love my wife, but I'm not ready to wash the dishes. I don't need to take out the garbage. I love her very much. <laughs> I'll tell her what's good for you, how much I love you. It doesn't work like this. 
respecting your wife, the same thing is respecting God, grounds you. That's why we need the fear of God. That keeps you always in, ch in check. That's, it's not about what, how much I love and what I want and how much I get overwhelmed. And what God wants for me now. That's what that's all about. That's why King David says here, this thank sufferings I will offer you because the Moshiach will come, the only sacrifices, the only prayers that will be meaningful, not there will be no other prayers, not there will be no other sacrifices, there will be meaningful will be the sacrifices and the prayers of thanksgiving. This will always be the, the understanding that I'm so small and God is, and, and it's overwhelming. This sense of love will always be there. And even more, probably. Okay. Even when uh, Mashiach comes, yes. even, even more. Even more. For you have saved my us. My soul from death, indeed my free from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living. Very nice. Now we know the rest of the story. <laughs> now we'll go to chapter 57. For the leader, a plea to avoid destruction. A mikhtam by David when he fled from Shaul into a cave. Okay, okay, we'll stop right here. Avoid destruction. David is asking from God, al Tashris, what type of destruction he should be avoiding? He should be avoiding the destruction of... David was running away from Saul. He asked from God for two things. God, make sure that, that Saul doesn't kill me and make sure that I don't kill him. Not that you, both ways. He shouldn't kill Saul, and Saul shouldn't kill him. That was this, wasn't that the same thing with, with Jacob? Was it you're right, you're right. That's a tzaddik. And what was the story? The story was, what was when, when was Saul in a cave? Saul was in a cave. Paper, so interesting. It looks like from 200 years ago. Saul was running away to En Gedi. Who was in Israel? You ever heard about En Gedi? Mm -hmm. I was there. Yeah. yeah. I was never there. But uh, En Gedi is a place that King David ran away from Saul. Mm. And he was hiding in a cave. And somebody told Saul, reported to Saul, that David is hiding in En Gedi. And Saul took 3,000 soldiers, 3,000, not the soldiers, Giborim, uh, very strong people. And he was running after David to look for him in En Gedi. On the way to En Gedi, somewhere there, Saul needed to go out to the restroom. He entered a cave. In the bottom of the cave was David there with many, with many of his warriors, many of his soldiers, hiding from Saul. The king went in by himself. He went to the rest of nobody bothered. In this cave they were there. But the soldiers, David's people, wanted to kill Saul. They told them, God delivered them to your end! They argued, Abba leorgecha, Ashkem leorgo. Somebody who comes to kill you, somebody who is an, has an agenda, clear agenda to kill you. Saul tried to kill David many times, not once. David saved himself like this in the last second. Torah says you're allowed to get up and kill him. Don't have to wait until he'll kill you. Then will be a proof that he really wants to kill you because it might be a little too late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then you have to kill him before he's actually killing you. If he says that he wants to kill you, it's good enough. He doesn't have to prove himself. Something about Iran. <laughs> ring, yeah. ring exactly. Anybody, yeah. You don't have to wait for them to... Exactly. David says, I am not killing the anointed of God. Is the king... He will not kill the anointed. David didn't allow them to touch him. What he did, he came by in the in the dark, and he cut off a piece of his uh, what is this called lapel. lapel lapel from his from his from his uh, coat. Saul came out, 
And Saul goes out. David goes out and says, and calls him, My king! What do you want from me? My king Saul, and he bowed down to him. Saul is turning around, he sees David standing there with his people. And he told them, Look, I was able to kill you. What are you wanting after me? Why are you believing you bad people or bad mouthing me that I want to hurt you? If I just wanted to kill you, I had a chance right there to kill you. Why are you the great king of Israel running after a, a small person like me? What, who am I for next to you? So so I am. And he says, is this is the voice of, of, my, of my, my, my son David? And Saul started to cry. And he was regretting, he, was, he said, I'm sorry that I'm running after you. And I know, he told them this time, that you are going to be the king after me. How he knew this. How Saul now realized that this is the king after him. He knew that he lost his kingdom a while ago. You know the story that we read in the Aftorah from before Shabbat, before Purim, about King Saul and the Amalekites. He didn't kill Amal the king of the Amalekites, Agag, and therefore uh, Samuel came to him mm -hmm. and told them, God will re remove you from his kingdom, from your job, and he will give over the, his kingdom to somebody who is better than you. Or he didn't tell them who. He didn't tell them who. How he knew. This is the first time Saul turns to David and tells him, you are, I know that you are going to be the king after me, and I'm asking you not to destroy my family, not to kill my family. That's what he told him. How he knew it? Because when, when Samuel came to him and told him, you, you, uh, uh, God took off the kingdom from you, he tore his lapel. And that he knew that he tore his lapel, lapel now too, said, you are going to be the king. That's what happened in the, in this cave. That's after he, after the prayer. So that's what happened in the in the cave that Saul was, uh, that uh, David was while Saul was running after him. Go ahead. Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me, for my soul relies on you, and I seek shelter in the shadow of your wings until the danger passes. I call to God Most High to God who rewards me. He sends forth from heaven and saves me. In spite of he who would devour me, Salah. God sends forth his kindness and devotion. Kindness and devotion, that's an interesting translation of Amitoi. Amitoi means his truth, his honesty. But okay, go ahead. <laughs> My soul resides among fierce lions, people who teeth and, uh, who, whose teeth and spears and arrows their tongue a sharp sword. You maybe will give him to read in number six. Go ahead. Be exalted above the heavens, O God, <clears throat> your glory over all the earth. They prepare a net for my feet to subdue my soul. They dig a pit before me, but they fall into it. Salah. My heart is faithful, O God, my heart is faithful. I shall sing and chant hymns. I shall sing and chant for God, basically. Go ahead. Awake, my soul, awake, O lyre and harp. I will awake the dawn. What is I will awake the dawn? I, I will awake the dawn. Talmud learns from it. King David used to wake up midnight and learn Torah until dawn. Awaking the dawn is written in the code of Jewish law that a person should wake up before dawn. He should awake the dawn. That's what we do every morning lately. <laughs> Since they change the clock, we awake the dawn. We come here before dawn. Especially um, Dr. Kosov. He awakes the dawn. <laughs> or maybe he doesn't sleep altogether, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, almost, it's getting there, right? He awakes the dawn. That means awake, it's written that when, for example, when the summer nights are getting shorter, before the, before the holidays, the month of February, it's written a person should start to wake up early to serve God, he should awake the dawn. That's what it means about Aira uh, Shacha. Not the dawn should wake me up, but I should awake the dawn. Not to be awake up, it's already the sun is in the middle of the sky. Hey, where are you? You missed half a day. You should, be, you should awake the dawn. 
And aren't the kings supposed to sleep in? The kings, I'm not the king. But King David, <laughs> I'm waking up, I have no choice. <laughs> but uh, King oh, David woke up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Midnight is to wake up. He's to go to sleep. Obviously, people used to go to sleep at that time. In the beginning of the night, there was no electricity, understand. They slept at night and they were awake at day. Then, uh, and, uh, and by midnight, is to wake up already and start to prepare for the day. Learn Torah until morning, until dawn. And by dawn, they used to come in and start to... And, uh, he, had, he used to have meetings about the kingdom. Number 10. Because of the one who wakes the dawn. <laughs> <laughs> I will praise you among the peoples, God. I will sing to you among the nations, for your kindness is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches... Oh! Ho, 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 ho. For Jesus your kindness God. are as high as the heavens. <laughs> Stop, stop, stop right here. Kindness has eyes as uh, eyes heavens. I want to show you something. Turn to chapter 108. Chapter 108 is on page 319. Um, you want to read? The beginning of chapter 108? Yeah, please. A song, a psalm of David. My heart is faithful, O God. I shall sing and chant hymns with all my soul. Awake, O lyre and harp. I will awake the dawn. Sounds some familiar? Mm -hmm. Almost the same words. Continue. I will praise you among the peoples, O God, and chant to you among the nations. Sounds familiar too. Continue. For your kindness reaches beyond the heavens. Beyond the heavens. Here it's written... Up to the heavens, here it's written behind the heavens. What's going on here? <laughs> well, okay, here is a story. Once the Baal Shem Tov was the founder of the Hasidic movement, he went to visit a city. And they took him there. It was a big yeshiva there. He took him for a tour in the yeshiva. He walks in, he goes around, back and forth. He says, the yeshiva is full of Torah. They were in seventh heaven, such a compliment. Before he left, he told them, you know why it's full of Torah? Because the Torah doesn't go up to heaven. Whoa! He said, the Torah is full of ego, full of selfishness. It's all about yourself. Such a Torah doesn't go up to heaven. It's stuck here. What takes for the Torah and the mitzvah to go up to heaven? It's written, the Alter Rebbe writes in Tanya, that Oi Raise, Torah and Mitzvahs, Belot Chilu Verechimu, without love of God and fear of God, Lo Pachelele cannot be elevated, fly to heaven. Basically, every Mitzvah that I do needs to have wings to fly. What are the wings to fly? I mean, love and fear of God. What does this mean? When I do a mitzvah, I wake up in the morning and put on film. If I do it with I have my eyes closed, I mean, you better do the mitzvah not to do, don't get me wrong. But when I do it without any love, any fear, any excitement, any emotions, it's like stones. It stays there. It doesn't go up. You created something, but it doesn't make it all the way there. The love and fear of God that a person feels when he does the mitzvah, his emotions are the wings that fly the mitzvah up, that set it up. Saying you're learning Torah. You learn Torah for the sake of God, that your Torah goes up to heaven. You learn Torah for the sake of yourself to show off that you're a big scholar, let's say. Oh, for whatever reason it is, or somebody will pay you whatever, whatever the reason is. It's not for God that the Torah doesn't go up to heaven. It's a Torah. You cannot say you didn't learn Torah. You learn Torah. But it's, it's missing something. It's, it's, it's almost like a dead body. You created a body, but there is no soul. There is no life. There is no neshome in the mitzvah. There is the body of the mitzvah. There is the neshome of the mitzvah. The soul of the mitzvah. There is the body of the learning Torah. There is the soul of the learning Torah. If you didn't breathe a soul in the, nasr, in the mitzvah, there is a, a mitzvah. It's a, dead, it's a dead soul. It's a dead mitzvah. It's a dead Torah. That's what the Alter Rebbe taught in Tanya, established in Tanya. And it's a known thing, everybody will learn Tanya. 
knows that. It's a very important thing, because that's what really Chabad brought, the Hasidic movement, Chabad especially, brought to the whole idea. Jews did mitzvahs before. They brought dead mitzvahs. They were like this. Mm. Doing it by rote? By rote. The thing. idea of singing in a synagogue? Unheard of. Singing? No, it's a disgrace. No, it's nothing. What are you singing here? Dancing and show? Who heard of such a thing? Joy. Mitzvahs with joy. Joy. The word joy was out of the joy. What was it? Even I used to go to Hastora to Shul's in New York. The Rabbi used to say we should go to every Shul in Hastora to, 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 help, to bring the joy of the holiday. Really, every holiday used to go to every Shul in New York. All over New York. Work for three, four hours to bring joy to people. People dance in the store, like office. they take the Torah, mm -hmm. they make one circle, they're tired, bring it down. <laughs> That's it. Where you find them getting excited? At the baseball game. Oh, <laughs> everybody wakes up. Oh, they scream. Oh, there is life. There is enjoyment. Everybody's on Saturday, you see? These guys know how to be alive. <laughs> the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. The joy from the from the stadium is to come to shul. That's what Hasidic movement brought. Turn the shul into a stadium, into excitement. Okay, the Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe, after he wrote the Tanya, he was arrested. Remember the story? He was arrested. He was in jail in St. Petersburg for 53 days. Actually, 53 days is the amount of chapters. That ch he wrote 53 chapters in the Tanya. He was in jail 53 days, paying for every chapter, so to speak. Is it related to the parishes a little bit? Yeah, also 53 parishes in the Torah. Hmm. In any case, after he came out from jail, it was a big, a big victory. The Tsar said that he can be... The Tsar basically made the Hasidic movement an official movement of a part of Judaism. The Zal legitimized the Hasidic movement. If not for the Zal, we would still fight until today. So it backfired on the building again. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> You're right. They didn't want to make, they didn't allow to even to open any shul or separate. They, because they, exactly, because they got, they got them to jail, they backfired big time on them. Ch Chabad became legitimate by law, and nobody was, if you, and if you fight the movement, you get, get in trouble with the law, with the Russian law. You can almost say an analogy with Purim, the Jew, Jew and Jew. You're right. Then after, after he came out from jail, he went to see all the great rabbis to meet with them, to convince them, to talk about, you tell me your questions kind of thing. That one, one of them to ask them, you wrote in the Tanya, the Torah and Mitzvahs, without uh, love and fear of God, do not go up to heaven. Do not go up all the way. What's the worst? What's the, what the, what's the source? The, for, where, where are you taking it from? Where you got it from? He told him it's written in the Zohar. He said, that's not good enough for me. I need something in the Talmud. He told him, he quoted him a Talmud. The Talmud says, the Talmud compares these two verses. Here in cha on page 159, chapter 57, number 11, it's written, for your kindness is as high as the heavens. Ki godel at shomayim chazdecho, until the heaven. Your kindness, your kindness means God rewards the Jew for doing mitzvahs, to which level he rewards them. And he can reach, so to speak, the, the, his, 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 reward, his mitzvahs come up to the heaven. That's it. And in chapter 108 it's written, number four, number five, for your kindness reaches behind the heavens. That, that sounds like a contradiction. That the Talmud says, when, is, when, when I get reward, it comes only until the heavens. And when I get reward, it comes above the heavens. When is the Jew reaching above the heavens, behind the heavens? When is our mitzvahs reach till heaven? And when our mitzvahs reaching above the heaven? Because it's two verses in the book of Psalms. At Shomayim Kvidecho, until the heavens, or Me'ala Shomayim. Then the Talmud is answering, when a Jew is doing a mitzvah for his own sake, Shelo Lishma, when he's doing something for himself, just he's doing the mitzvah, even if it's for money, or for reward, or for being recognized, 
this kind of a mitzvah brings reward only from the level that's until the heavens. But when he's doing a mitzvah, lishmo, when he's doing the mitzvah just for the sake of God, not because he will gain something from it, not because he will gain rec any recognition, any reward, even not spiritual reward, he's doing it just for the sake of God, then the mitzvah reaches me'al ha'shomayim, above the heavens, it reaches to the highest of the highest. And that was the proof for the point of the Alter Rebbe that he said that the Torah and mitzvahs, when you perform a mitzvah without love and fear, it doesn't fly to heaven, doesn't go, go up to heaven. And that brings us to the story of the Baal Shem Tov. That the Baal Shem Tov was once visited in a, in a yeshiva. He came in and he went around and he said, wow, this place is full of Torah. The heads of the yeshiva were very, were very impressed. They were, so what a compliment. And then he said, you know why it's full of Torah? Because your Torah doesn't go up to heaven. Then they were all insulted, why not? He said, Torah that's not learned with love and fear of God, who doesn't have the, the wings of love and fear of God, does not go up to heaven. This Torah was Torah Shelo Lishma. Torah that they learned in this yeshiva was a Torah to show off, to show that I'm a greater scholar than my friend, and I will prove him that he's wrong, and it's all about personal ego. This kind of Torah doesn't go up to heaven. Torah that's done, I and mean, when we are Jew learns Torah because it's the wisdom of God, because it's that, because it's that what God wa wants us to, to, to know about Him. This Torah that you will learn just to connect with God, to unite with God, this Torah Shlishma that's go up to that's done with love of God, with fear of God, with emotional, with an emotional excitement, this Torah goes up to heaven. And that's what the Alter Rebbe brought as a proof for the statement that he made in the Tanya, that Torah and mitzvahs that are without love and fear of God do not fly to heaven.